Well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, got a couple of announcements to start off with here that are a little bit unconventional. Uh, first of all, Noah is not here. He and his wife had a baby uh, last night, which is very good news because she was a few days over her due date. So nobody was very happy with that. Uh, so they had a baby yesterday, a little baby girl. I uh, named her Charlotte Rose, so everybody's doing well, and uh, Noah is at home enjoying uh, his new daughter with his family. So uh, I'm kind of taking over the host duties this evening, uh, and our guest speaker for tonight is Lance Klessig, and Lance texted me a picture about 45 minutes ago of a tire off of his trailer that was completely shredded. He had a tire blowout as he was coming home from doing some workout in one of his fields or pastures. So he promises me he's going to be here. He's just going to be a little bit late. So um, I am going to just do a few announcements and do a few uh, uh, things like that, introduction type things while we're waiting for Lance to, to get back uh, from his tire repair. Uh, so just a couple of things. Uh, you may have seen or heard uh, we are putting on a soil health conference at our Kansas facility, at our Iola, Kansas facility. Uh, we're going to be doing that uh, December 15th and 16th. Uh, if you go to our website, greencoverseed.com, you can find information on there or go to our web or our Facebook page. Uh, there's information on there as well. Uh, Jimmy Emmons, who we had as our first webinar speaker, uh, is going to be one of our keynote speakers, but Dale Strickler is going to be uh, talking. I'm going to be doing my carbonomics talk there. Uh, we've just got a really good lineup of, of both local talent from the area who are doing regenerative practices, as well as having uh, some other folks from across the state of Kansas. Uh, Sean Tiffany with Tiffany Cattle Company is going to be there uh, talking about how they integrate livestock, uh, soil health, and cover crops in their system as well. So that promises to be a really good conference. It's going to be a two-day conference. Uh, the food is going to be fantastic. It's only a hundred bucks, uh, which is, you know, most of that is going towards uh, just covering the food cost. So we're, uh, if you're interested in that at all, uh, we would love to have you be part of that. Uh, next week's webinar, and let me just check to make sure I'm not lying here. Uh, next week's webinar is going to be uh, Matt Kincaid, Macaulay Kincaid. Uh, he is a very progressive, innovative young farmer uh, from Jasper, Missouri, so not all that far from our uh, Iowa, Kansas location. He was one of our speakers uh, at our last event that we had uh, in Iola and uh, was really one of the uh, one that got the highest reviews. People really loved his story. Uh, he's doing some really innovative things for that part of the world, growing some seed crops, integrating livestock. Uh, just doing some really great uh, soil health integration type things. So Matt Kincaid is going to be next week. Uh, and then the week after that, uh, the 23rd, so that would be the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, uh, we're going to have Dr. David Johnson. Uh, and he is the, uh, he and his wife are the inventor of the Johnson Sioux compost method. And, and actually as a bonus, uh, his wife is going to join us as well. So we're actually going to have the, both the Johnson and the Sioux uh, and, and we're going to have a discussion about uh, the Johnson Sioux composting method, but, but more than just, it's not just going to be a lesson on how do you do that, because you can look it up and you can watch videos on how you can build that. They're going to be talking more about how do you use the product that you can make from their system. Uh, they'll be showing some success stories from other people that have used uh, the extract from that Johnson Sioux compost method. Uh, how they've used that on their farms and, uh, and how they've seen some really, really great results. So that's going to be a really exciting one. Uh, you won't want to miss that. And then the week after Thanksgiving, uh, December 30th, uh, Dale Strickler, uh, our very own Dale Strickler, is going to be on. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure what his topic is going to be, but I know one of the things that he'll be talking about is his new book, uh, Dale's third book uh, called Restoring Your Soil uh, is going to be released here any any time. Uh, this is kind of an advanced copy that we got, uh, but he will be uh, talking about, you know, soil health topics. But this book is really, uh, of the three books that he's written, he said this is his favorite one uh, because it talks more about the soil and um, 
And that's just, if you, any of you know Dale, you know that's just a real passion of his. So he'll be talking about how do you restore your soil uh, and, and probably talking a little bit more about his new book. So we're pretty excited about having all that put together and uh, being able to offer that to you. So uh, we're really excited to be able to uh, bring all this to you. Uh, and I'd be really excited uh, to bring Lance to you as well. So hopefully as soon as he gets his uh, tire fixed, uh, we'll be able to get going. Uh, in the meantime, if anybody has any kind of general soil health questions, feel free to type them in the chat window. Uh, I can do my best to answer any questions that you have uh, about soil health things. Uh, we'd love to be able to just kind of have a dialogue about some of that. I know that uh, with this webinar format, we're not, you're not able to talk back to me. Um, hey, here we got Lance coming. Hey, Lance. Howdy, guys. <laughs> I was just uh, I was just telling them your your uh, tire woes there, um, man. That that just seems like things go bad at just the worst times, don't they? <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's been a, a rough day, but thankfully we were able to get a a tire guy up to us uh, with a trailer tire, and then of course he didn't pump it up, so we. Um, <laughs> I had a generator in the back of the truck, had the floor jack, and had the air compressor. So we <laughs> we got oh, it oh, on. We're all yeah. good. So yeah, no, I was uh, I was just kind of giving people a rundown of the the other webinars that we're doing. And uh, right. I don't know if you've seen this yet, Lance. Uh, Dale's new book. Uh, this is Dale oh. Strickler's new book, Restoring Your Soil. He'll be talking about this and other things here in a couple of weeks. He'll be the webinar. Uh, speaker. So this is brand new. I don't even know if it's actually released yet, uh, but okay. kind of exciting stuff there as well. So um, yeah, thank you for joining us, especially in light of all of the you know craziness of this. I told people, you know, that Noah, uh, Noah and Sierra had their baby, which is right. you know, great praise. Uh, and so we're, we're glad for that. And so I'm happy to step in and, and help out for that. So uh, let me just give you kind of a brief introduction. The good news is we didn't have to do a little trial session and your audio sounds great from there. Okay. So, <laughs> and that seems to be working fine. So we've known Lance for, gosh, I don't know, what, five, six years probably, Lance. We've been doing a lot of stuff back and forth. Lance, uh, I think when we first met him, you were working for a conservation district uh, right. up in uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, kind of right on the border there, aren't you, between yep. Wisconsin and Minnesota. Yeah. But ever since that we've known Lance, I don't know of hardly anybody that I know of that has as much passion and excitement around the topic of soil health as what Lance has had. He's just he's just always sharing pictures of success stories that either he's had or uh, people that he's helping and working with. And I think you even get more excited about when you see it working on other people's operations as well. Uh, right. but he's just always been a great, great proponent of soil health. And, and now he's got his own farm, uh, right. which explains the flat tire, because with your own farm comes your own flat tires, right. your own problems and your own issues. So, so he's gone from helping others to now just fully implementing these practices on, on his own farm there in Minnesota. So we wanted right. Lance just to share kind of his regenerative ag journey. And mm -hmm. uh, I think you've got a few slides there that you can kind of walk us through. Uh, and then... Uh, you know, as he's talking, uh, folks, if you have questions for him, again, feel free to put those in the chat box or in the question and answer uh, section of the webinar here, and uh, we'll have a discussion uh, at the end of our time here, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get everybody's questions answered. So, uh, Lance, take it away. I am going to hide myself, and I'll try to get this. We're recording this, so we'll have it uh, on YouTube later. I'll try to get it going on Facebook here. I don't know if I'm smart enough to do that or not, but I'll try. Okay. Can you see my, um, can you see my screen? Not, not yet. Okay. And if there's something I need to do, let me know, I guess. Yeah, I don't. Um... Let's see. Maybe I have to request it. Um, share screen. Here we go. Sorry. Oh, Host is dis disabled participant sharing screen. So I think you need to somehow um, allow me to um, share my screen. 
<clears throat> you know, it's kind of funny, Keith. Maybe this will, but I don't know if this is bad luck or good luck, but you see this right here? This is a sweatshirt that I've been wearing all day. <laughs> so, and I just <laughs> tore it off when I turned the computer on. So, yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> good luck that you made it back. Not the bad luck <laughs> that you had the flat tire. <laughs> Uh, try. I made you the host. Go ahead and try sharing now. Okay. Let's see. It looks like it's going to work now. There we go. Yep. Okay. Let me just put it on um, slideshow. Okay. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So take it away. Okay. Sounds great. Well, I really appreciate, Keith, uh, the invitation and the opportunity to share um, yeah, the journey that I've been on, not only personally, but also, I guess, professionally over the last 15 or so years, um, I have worked for a conservation district here the last almost six years uh, in Southeast Minnesota, but um, prior to that, I actually uh, worked for a couple other conservation organizations. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, um, I titled my presentation, The Successes and Challenges in the Upper Midwest. And I think anywhere I go and people I talk to, you know, we always have challenges and we, you know, generally have some success stories too. Um, so I just want to kind of share some things that I'm doing on my own farm, but really the people that I get to work alongside, which I'm really blessed to work along some really awesome farmers um, across Wisconsin and Minnesota, Iowa predominantly, but also the Dakotas and uh, Missouri, Illinois as well. Some. So a couple pictures here. Um, those are my kids last year after a cover crop um, that we grew here and took off for forage. Um, the lower right or lower left, excuse me, uh, we'll get into that. But uh, this is uh, an intern that I had, uh, Michael, and we're out looking at a field that was seeded zero rye with the combine. Um, blowing seed right underneath uh, the combine snoots. So, um, so yeah, that's we're, we're going to go on a little bit of a journey here today. Um, I guess Keith, if you have questions or things pop up, sure, uh, feel free to interrupt. Yep, so, we'll do. Um, so yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the challenges that that I see regularly. Um, like I said, some success stories, but also some tools that I think we have at our disposal um, and just want to kind of share some observations there. Um, and then lastly, uh, just some opportunities that I really see in front of us um, if we're willing to think outside the box. Um, so yeah, a couple of quick pictures here. A good friend of mine, Everett Rolfing, has gone from a chisel plow system uh, to more of a VT system, planting everything green, all of his uh, corn, soybeans green, um, and just really embraced it. Uh, and the, the profitability is, has been fantastic uh, for him. Um, I'll show some more pictures. And again, this is Southeast Minnesota. Um, then on the, uh, the right here, we have some relay cropping with, um, this is John Coots actually. I went over, he lives um, all kind of between Madison, Milwaukee um, area and has been doing this for, I think, six or eight years um, where he's taking off two crops. Um, first, the, obviously, this, the, the red wheat um, and then soybeans later on. Uh, so that's where we're headed. Um, thought I'd share a little bit about who I am my family. So again, this is Ada and Grayson here on the right um, with, yeah, some pretty awesome <laughs> uh, radishes and purple top turnips in November of last year. Um, on the left there, we I had a neighbor come in with his uh, Great Plains drill. And so they are cleaning off some of the soil that's a little bit sticky. Um, I almost said dirt and that would have been a problem, but it is soil. <laughs> so um, so yeah, Heart and Soil Ridge, that's the farm that my wife and I uh, and our five kids um, are blessed to operate. We've been here for about two years. And really the, the thrust behind this is uh, a few years back, I was able to go out to see Gabe Brown's ranch, spend the day with him. And then since then went on a couple different um, 
all went down to a couple different soil health academies, I guess, in Kansas and Missouri. And that's really pushed us in a direction to um, not just talk the talk, I guess, but also walk the walk. So we were able to buy this farm here um, the week before COVID hit. So about not quite two years ago. Um, this is a picture from this summer in one of our fields that I call our crazy mix. Um, a lot of oats, a lot of sunflower, but also underneath it, um, sorghum sedan, a bunch of millets, clovers. There's like almost 30 different species that I'm actually grazing right now. Um, and let's see, Heart and Soil Ridge. So people ask me about the name. So <laughs> um, the heart of hospitality and also giving people the opportunity to really experience regeneration. So we have um, three on-farm cottages actually, where people actually stay with us on our farm and we give farm tours almost daily. And you'll see a little bit about that. And then my passion for soil and helping people understand soil. Um, so now I have a, you know, a farm that is in my demonstration. Um, so um, yeah, so experience regeneration, that's one of our tag lines for our farm. Um, we have, um, Grayson has 23 goats, so we call them Grayson's goats uh, here on the right. Um, I'm going to be doing some custom grazing with them next year. We're going to um, bring in a billy here in about a month to, to breed them all. Uh, we have five of these hen wagons uh, that we move around about every other day. And then we also do custom grazing here, which uh, I don't think this is the video, but of, of uh, heifers. Um, and that's been a really good experience. This, this piece of ground here actually is where we ran pigs um, and then brought in uh, no-till drilled, again, that crazy mix. And here they are. This is about two weeks ago. Um, yeah, millets, a lot of different brassicas, sun hemp in there as well. So um, this is just actually the view of, of uh, the sun coming up out of my bedroom window. And so off to the left there, you can actually see a couple of the farm rentals. Um, and then we market eggs and we do a monthly egg subscription. And we have 120 happy hens that call our farm home. Um, Keith had mentioned that I, I have worked for a soil and water conservation district here in Southeast Minnesota, way down right next to La Crosse. And that's been really an awesome experience to learn to help people uh, adopt covers and, and the different soil health principles, get more into no-till, grazing and the like. Um, and actually just, just um, I wanna say two months ago, I actually quit my full-time job there and went um, back to the farm. <laughs> and so I'm really excited about that. That's probably, maybe Keith, you didn't even know that, but really excited about that. Um, the picture here is just a good friend that uh, converted a rotary hoe and he's blowing on seed in V2 to V5 corn. Um, and then on the left there, that's a friend, Sheldon Lumen, who's just been farming for, I think, two, three years now and really jumping in whole hog. Uh, entire farm is now being cover cropped. And um, yeah, so um, that's a little bit of history on myself. Um, Soil Keepers is a educational and uh, on-farm consulting company that I started a couple years ago after the uh, coaching and encouragement of, of uh, Ray Archuleta actually. So, so again, I, I guess I wanted to pause and, and just uh, provide a big shout out to all the farmers that I've been able to work alongside um, over the years, um, not just the last five or six here in Southeast Minnesota, but um, the last 15, 20, because they've been very um, instrumental in helping me learn, but then also the ability to share what I've uh, learned from them, uh, and then also incorporate that onto my own farm. So, um, yeah, and I guess without going any further, this is the back of my business card. I do believe very strongly in the soil health principles. Um, I think many of us probably watching are quite familiar with them, but um, they are very foundational. And um, Keith was kind enough uh, 
last year, I think it was for the soil health resource guide to let me actually write an article about that. Um, but I think number six, the context one is re really stands out to me, knowing your context. And without getting into a lot of details, I, I best keep moving. But I think I see that as a wagon wheel as the hub of, of the other five um, principles. So, um, so you know, I, again, I talked about the biggest challenges. So I, I want to pose a question. What do you think are the biggest challenges? You know, maybe you're watching from Wisconsin, or maybe you're from the Dakotas, or, I, you know, where, I don't know where you're tuning in from. But again, we all have challenges to adopting and making soil health work. Um, and, um, I want to try to unpack some of those, share some of those. So, um, maybe it's taking soil in the upper part of my hand here. Uh, this is actually down in Missouri at the North Nemo conference, but taking it from that state to a much better state, you know, that that's a challenge, um, because we, we have, we have the soil resource that we've been given or that we've been farming for a while. Um, uh, here, these pictures are actually from Gabe Brown's when we were out there a couple years ago, um, you know, taking the soil from the left, high synthetic uh, tillage um, to the, you know, the soil on the right, uh, which is one, from one of Gabe's fields, of course, one of his most profitable crops, um, hairy vetch and, and rye and wheat and um, that he combines. Um, so, you know, that those are challenges, but definitely as we use the soil health principles, we can be heading down the journey of improving our soils and improving our bottom lines, um, regenerating our communities. So, um, so one challenge I often hear is I'm too far north or east or west, or I don't get enough moisture. I'm farming in the plains or out west farther yet. Um, I would say those are definitely things that we really want to consider. We have to consider, but, you know, I'm able to work with farmers from, you know, northern Minnesota right up to the, you know, Canadian border all the way down into, you know, the Great Plains area. And by and large, we're able to be successful. So I think we want to be careful with saying that I'm too far north or east or south or have 20 inches of rain versus somebody with 30 inches of rain. A um, couple pictures here. These are from Southeast Minnesota. Um, friend of mine here, he's out frost seeding with his fertilizer buggy. I believe that's in February. This is a couple years back because it was a late fall prior to and wasn't able to get all the covers in with a no-till drill on the corn ground, ground froze. Um, here's a friend of mine, John Meyer. Uh, he's actually using his old, <laughs> I believe they're 8,600 uh, drills to just dis distribute the seed, right? Um, just as a means to get uniform, um, you know, coverage. And he's out frost seeding. Frost is still in the ground. It's just starting to come out. Um, so again, we're going to use the tools that we have. And I don't think we're too far in any direction to really make things like this work. Um, and I want to also point out that these are pieces of equipment that both of these farmers had. Um, they're not new pieces of equipment that they went out and um, bought. Um, let's see, one of the challenges that I often hear is that it won't work here. I've been told that hundreds of times. Um, and the, you know, we do have learning experiences, we have failures, but I like to look at them as lessons learned. Um, so here's a farmer, actually he was a neighbor when I uh, lived in Wisconsin here um, before we bought this farm, you know, um, sierra rye um, with some hairy vetch and clover actually in it, corn was planted green and came back with a roller crimper and you can see down here in the lower part i mean it was full headed rye mature rye here's some more um now because they had the legume in there they used chemi chemicals to terminate it but again this is on irrigated ground and um, worked quite well for them so again 
when we have these ideas that we think are not going to work or they can't work here, I think we better be careful and, and maybe hit the pause button. So let's see. Um, so here I have a video. Uh, let's cross my fingers. It'll play. And I want you to take special note of what's up on the head here. So again, we're looking at looking for innovative ways to establish cover crops um, to incorporate the soil health principles onto our farms and our ranches. Uh, this father son team uh, duo, Mike and Mark Stokes, um, I don't even know how many years ago, four or five years ago, um, they didn't have a no-till drill and they decided to get a, a, that Gandhi air box on their head and it blows the, the seed down um, right underneath the snoots. There's a deflector and it's worked out quite well. Um, and these guys have been no-tilling for about 20 years and covers for about 10, I believe, have some fantastic soils. But again, people say, well, I can't spend the time to you know, fill up the little hopper full of rye seed well. Maybe you do have time, especially when you don't have any hired labor and it's just you and your dad or you and your son or daughter. Um, if I can get this to go to the next one without. Okay. Um, actually, Liam, you gotta be quiet. I got my, <laughs> my second oldest in here with me. Um, so here actually is Mike filling uh, the, the Gandhi and um, can do, I think, around 12 acres. They're seeding about 40 pounds. And again, it's saving a pass. And then when we look here, this is that same picture I think I said I showed you earlier. This is the following spring. And that's pretty darn good uh, coverage, in my opinion. Lots of live roots there. We're out digging, doing some water infiltration tests. Um, and with the faithful shovel, my best friend, one of my best friends. Um, one of the challenges I hear often is that we don't we don't have um, you know when we use cover crops or no-till some of the different soil health principles we don't have yield and I would really buck that hard I actually meant to put um, some numbers here but a good friend of mine down uh, right on the Iowa border that has had just fantastic yields but also probably more important than that is his ROI is just off the charts. And one other thing I like to point out is most farms that I work with, at least up here, if they're doing any sort of amount of tillage, they can only infiltrate a half an inch to an inch of rain per hour. I've done hundreds of these, you know, with the little rings. Um, but on his farm, on his management, I think 1200 acres or so, six to eight inches is the norm and um, it's increasing still. And so I just, when we think about that, um, that has huge implications, especially when we have droughtier conditions, um, but getting the water in the soil profile um, is huge. So I wanted to um, kind of segue from challenges into looking at tools because I think we have lots of tools at our disposal, right? We have no-till corn planters, we have no-till drills, we have Gandhi ear boxes on top of corn heads. Um, and those are all great tools, but I think we also wanna look at um, tools. Uh, I guess I, I wanna look at a couple pictures here. So this is down actually at a soil health academy that I was at with Ray Archuleta at, when he hosted at a nearby farm. but. Um, the tools that stand out to me right here are, are the, the cows uh, that is stocked at about 500 and some thousand pounds of beef to the acre. Uh, so they're, they're, the, they're a tool that can be very helpful in our management, just like goats or sheep. The reels and this elect electricity here, those are tools. Um, we'll come back to my friend Tom here in a, in a second. But again, tools are super important as long as we know how to use them and we are strategic. Um, put this picture in because I was a grazing specialist for a handful of years, right out of uh, college actually, I milked cows on the weekends. Um, 
here we're using these girls uh and we actually have a 12 hour break here and then we have uh, another group of bread heifers and bread cows you can't see it but then there's another 12 hour break and then another group of young stock so this farmer is using those girls as tools um and the farmer i used to milk cows for he used to tell me his name was jim he used to tell me lance i'm really a, a harvester of solar energy in a you know a person that grows grass the byproduct is really the milk that comes through the cow and you know he talked to me a lot and often about his job was to grow grass and as much as he could um and that's really stuck with me uh let's see some of the other tools here you look that's a, a fancy dancy um eight dollar electric cord reel from menards or your local home hardware store i have a pile of those i have a pile of, of gallagher reels and in uh, terror gates but um again those are all tools here you can see those those reels again but also how we place our bales strategic outwintering so we don't have to haul manure those are all tools why not or <laughs> You might chug it a chuckle, but I say, why not uh, plant cover crops or why not strategically outwinter our cattle um, to make more money, to make profit, to save work? Um, some of our tools, uh, again, the water infiltration ring, that can be a very helpful tool to look at. Um, are we actually capturing the rainfall that we've been blessed with? Um, it might be hard to fathom, but many times I tell farmers that, yeah, you told me you got a three inch rain and it came in a half an hour, but I don't think you captured more than half of that. And it's not to try to be insultful or insulting, um, but these rings are telling, right? They're a tool. Um, our earthworm friends, those are definitely tools. Um, and not only for air increased air, but also increased water infiltration and the like. Um, this is a picture from Tom Cotter's fields. He's actually coming up. I have another picture of him, but all those earthworms are very valuable tools. Um, nature's rototillers are our creator's uh, design at work. Um, and so often I go on farms where it's hard to find an earthworm or in one shovel full and then I get to the next farm that's been doing soil health and they have 15 or 20 per shovel full and then when you think about that um, across an acre uh, acre foot um, that is a whole lot of, of <laughs> a lot of goodness I guess is what I would say so another tool is so this is a friend Tom Cottery farms over by Austin Minnesota the reason I put this picture in is because Tom is innovative. He's also super passionate. He's willing to try just about anything um, on his farm, on his rented ground as well. Um, and he also has contagious enthusiasm, right? I've been able to co-present with him a number of times and he has a willingness to learn. Uh, I would consider him a lifelong learner. Um, so a tool is who do we associate with? Who do we network with? Maybe it's somebody close to us, 20 miles, five miles down the road. Maybe it's somebody that's 50 or hundred or more, um, but being with like-minded people. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but this is a picture when we went out and paid Gabe Brown to spend a day on his ranch. Um, and these three guys now uh, are actually all my neighbors. They are all within five miles of my farm that I was able to buy. Um, and a little story here with Gabe, he wore Packer, a Packer sweatshirt because he right away wanted to challenge the status quo. We were coming from Southeast Minnesota. Little did he know that I'm a Packer fan, but again, he wore the Packer, fan, the Packer sweatshirt to kind of jab at us right out of the gate to get us thinking. Um, and then down the road, we actually did a video here in this field. This is one, uh, which then turned into a YouTube <laughs> channel for me. But um, again, who we network with, are we willing to invest, you know, driving nine hours for us to go to Gabe's farm and pay him um, a good amount of money to be on his, on his ranch? So again, I want to ask the question, what's our biggest challenge? Um, and the reason I ask that is because I think so often these challenges are 
Um, maybe it's just the way we look at them. And I would offer that sometimes our biggest challenge is probably what's in between our own ears and what we tell ourselves or what we allow ourselves to listen to from neighboring farmers and bankers and different type of folks like that. And I guess I'd like to encourage us to think about a lot of these challenges as opportunities, right? Um, because I really think they are. And I think you'll see why here in a second. Um, and optimize the opportunities. So 2021, the word I chose for the year was optimize. Um, and so here are some opportunities, right? Um, this is 60 inch corn here on the lower left using a spinner spreader and then coming back, and this is no-till corn, um, then coming back with a rotary hoe that we, you know, uh, this isn't mine, but we're able to lift those uh, tines up and get a little bit of incorporation. We did catch a rain. And then, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, I was actually supporting <laughs> wearing Mitchell Hora's Continue Meg hat. And here's the picture. And that corn, I didn't get a final number on what it ran, but uh, some significant cow chow uh, to the tune of probably six or eight weeks, I think is what Sheldon will have to graze now that the corn was just picked um, here a couple of weeks ago. So, so again, that's an opportunity. Most would say that doesn't work here or you know, won't work in my environment. It's working, it's working very well. Um, kind of keep moving here so I keep my time. Um, so here's an opportunity, um, was able to work with, um, my, here's Mike Unruh and his dad, Dave, and we were able to get our hands on a Mandaco. Um, Mike ran a couple fields and another friend ran a couple fields this spring. They planted the rye heavy last fall, 120, 130 pounds. Um, beans are planted at um, boot stage. And so then we made a day out of trying a couple different roller crimpers and uh, again, an opportunity to try something different. Wasn't going to be the highest yield? No. A couple of the fields actually flopped pretty hard. But again, we learned, right? And we're going to do something different next year. Um, and lo and behold, um, we used the equipment that we had in the neighborhood. The INJ was from an organic farmer a couple miles up the road. And then the local John Deere dealership had brought this Mandaco in and they let us demo it. And um, I was able to get uh, Julia up from No-Till Farmer to kind of just showcase these young guys that this is what they're trying. Um, here's an opportunity. Uh, again, here, these are, let's see if I can get it to work. Um, this is ground that our pigs went through because we raised pastured pigs, came through, drilled the crazy mix, and this was two weeks ago. There you go. Raising the crazy mix. Just moved them from back here where the turkeys are. And they are going to town. Look at this girl stretching and reaching. What a little diversity here. Some beauty too. Hey girls. So again, trying to incorporate livestock, that is one of the soil health principles, uh, but different types of livestock and diversifying what we're planting, right? And um, I grazed this off and actually a week and a half ago, I had a, a neighbor come through with his no-till drill and it got all drilled um, with a, a mix of rye and uh, hairy vetch and actually some camelina we we're gonna try out. So um again opportunities maybe you don't own the cattle i don't own these cattle i don't own these heifers <laughs> but um a friend of mine does and he ran a little bit short on pasture and so um it gave me an opportunity to learn more about running cattle even though i was raised on a, a cow calf farm growing up but i haven't had cattle for a number of years so fun to graze uh, and learn oops let's see um Part of optimizing, I think, again, is, is, is building a peer network. Um, here's good friend Everett Rolfing. Um, I've been able to ride along in his cabs of his tractors, I don't know, at least a dozen times when he's planting, when he's uh, combining whatnot, and learning and sharing 
what he's observing. And we were in a soil health hub group together for two winters. Um, and this summer was able to go down to uh, Iowa when Rick Clark and, and um, Russell and Hedrick and Jess Nad were in town. And again, learn, always learning, always being a lifelong learner. That's a very important part of making soil health work and being successful listening to, <laughs> to webinars like this. A um, couple of quick examples here, and then I'm about done. Uh, here's, a, again, a, an example on the right, Mike and Dave. Mike runs his own cover crop company, Unruh Cover Cropping, and he has a vertical tillage tool here that he uh, has a central seed box on. And so what did he do? You can see there is white, um, yeah, white <laughs> snow. <laughs> um, so right before this picture was taken, um, I think a couple days before he was out seeding cereal rye again, cause we had a late winter and, um, you know, using what he's got to get cover crops established. Um, here's our farm using again, here's four of my little kids, warm spring days, frost is coming out. It's getting a little muddy, but again, we're out broadcasting uh, a couple different species to get live roots, even though these fields had been no-tilled for many years, um, trying to find ways to incorporate covers. Here's a good friend, Joe Waller. Let's see if this works. So Joel uh, lives about, oh, about an hour away from me took a modified, let's see if I can get to the next slide, um, took a, a corn to tassler here, you can see a picture of it, and modified it, and he has his own, what he calls a, a cheap haggy, right, so he can drive standing corn, standing beans, and see just about anything, uh, the video you saw, we just had done a field day um, on the 10th of August. And he, that, that was actually at that field day when he was driving standing corn. Um, and so again, using, trying to keep things cheap and I don't have any pictures of the seeding, but, um, many times, most times the, we catch a decent rain within a couple of weeks after that. It's pretty amazing what type of forages we can have, um, you know, going forward, whether it's forages for like a grazing herd or forages what for what I would call this the underground herd, our soil biology. So um, again, um, we might think of having challenges as uh, these are actually my uncles um, that have 450 cows on grass and they had an interstate that went through their farm. Uh, and they found a way to keep renting land, buying some land. So they have 450 cows on grass. They market on their own cheese. Um, they hired in an artist and cheese maker. But again, when most people would look at that as a huge challenge, this big interstate, they have about 900 acres of grass that um, they're managing all their cows and um, all their steers and, and heifers as well on. Um, quick picture here of, uh, again, using what we have. John Deere 1750 planner, put some different components on it as far as closing wheels, uh, some heavier down pressure springs. And now we're planting, this is um, Sheldon Lumen. This is actually one of the other farmers that was planting into boot stage rye and um, came back and roller crimped. And this field did not turn out well. Um, actually came back after roller crimped it. It was uh, about two weeks later or so. Had good rye, a good, you know, standard rye, but it just, uh, we learned some things. Probably plant the beans a little bit later, um, a little bit deeper so that would slow them down. They got leggy. Um, so again, I just, I share those things because I really like doing videos and interviewing farmers about what's working, but also what's not working or what they're going to change. And so um, this is an example from this spring. Um, and then uh, I guess want to end with, <laughs> uh, we do raise pastured pork and we sell it as a premium. We use them as tools again to landscape. Uh, but then, you know, it's not just one pass. We can then bring back cattle, as you saw in the video. 
Uh, we have goats. Um, so again, and we don't have to own the cattle. We can do, we can be creative. Um, but this is just a picture I, I snapped this spring or this summer, I should say, of, of one of our, couple of our pigs. Um, so again, I guess my hope, my thought was to try to share not only some success stories, but also how do we overcome some of those challenges? How do we, um, you know, how do we form, you know, some peer groups and how do we um, really work together to make cover crops, soil health, um, successful on our farms and our ranches. So I think that's pretty much, pretty much what I have, Keith. Um, there's just my contact information. Um, and the reason I put long live the land is, uh, Jimmy Emmons has one that a state saying that says long live the soil. And the reason I end with this is because Lance means of the land. <laughs> and so I'm really thankful for the opportunity to take care of the land, not just my own farm, but help others take care of the land and um, yeah, produce nutrient dense foods <laughs> for my own family, but then for others. So um, yeah, Keith, I think that's kind of what I have. So yeah, no, that's great, Lance. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, folks, feel free to type your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box and uh, we'll uh, get going on those here. Uh, Lance, I got uh, just a couple of questions for you. I was very interested in your kind of your agro-tourism, uh, you know, how, how people can come and actually stay right there on the farm. Sure. So do you actually let them help with chores and, you know, <laughs> are, are you actually getting paid for people to come pay to do your chores or tell uh, me a little bit more about how that works because I think yeah. that's really interesting and, and it's actually something we've talked about doing mm. uh, and and do you have a lot of people that want to do that? Yeah. So um, I haven't charged anybody yet, yet <laughs> to do the chores, but people, most of our guests are urban based, sub sub suburban or urban. Mm -hmm. um, we are about two hours from the Twin Cities. And so um, people, especially with COVID, wanted to come and get away from things and have. So, yes, on our farm, we have three rental cottages. And we also are very close to the interstate, only about a mile and a half off. So that's helpful. But people, most, most of our guests have never held a chicken, never collected their own eggs. Um, you know, they can go out and chatty. One of our tame goats will come up and it's like a pet. He's, she's like a pet dog. And, you know, so again, why we talk about experiencing regeneration is because we, we offer nice, hospitality as far as you know the beds and, and the decor and my wife is really good at um, the farmhouse theme and then we're able to take people out on tours like I said not not every day but four or five days a week and so it is a big opportunity um, I'm not gonna lie that's that's the main reason I was able to wait to main way I was able to step away from my full-time mm -hmm. job is because of the success we've had here on the farm so yeah well that's great and I I think that you will continue to see that to grow mm -hmm. as, uh, as people, you know, people, people want to make that connection back to the land. Just so many of them don't have the opportunity. And so what a right. great way for them to do it there. Uh, so uh, somebody asked a question here. Uh, this is a great question. Do you have suggestions for nutrient cycling in perennial forage fields? Uh, is no tilling annuals after a first cut? of a perennial a good option and if so what species would you recommend um yeah i mean i think it's an opportunity there i guess kind of depends on again where you're located um and what type of perennials you know if we're talking like a perennial pasture um you know we do it quite often where we no till in early in the spring frost you know frost seed as far as like clovers and whatnot um but I think, you know, if you do want to take like a first crop of hay off or whatnot and come back in with some sort of warm season mix, I definitely see that as a opportunity. But I think you also have to make sure you have a good way to eliminate um, some of that competition. So, um, yeah, without knowing more of the specifics, I guess that's a little bit hard for me to. Yeah. But I think it is an option. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think I think you hit it right on the head with the competition thing. You know what what we've seen work for people is when you go to the completely opposite season. So if you've got a really good cool season pasture, 
you got to let the heat of the summer send it into kind of a dormant state and then plant your warm season annuals or or further south you know like in oklahoma and texas they have a lot of bermuda grass warm season annuals mm. that they can plant cool season things like rye grass and vetch and clovers they're planting that now and letting it grow over the winter so uh, you'll never outcompete a perennial with an annual so you got to got to be a little careful right uh, there. yeah and i i would agree with that even on some of my my crazy mix i actually graze it really hard to try to set back because there was some perennials in there you know that way the the even the cereal rye and the hairy vetch has a, a just trying to optimize that you know opportunity for them to come on strong yeah uh, so Matt has a challenge here because I asked a question in the chat, you know, what, what is, what is one of your biggest challenges? Cause I really like thinking that way, the, the way you were thinking there. So he says our never ending challenge is harvesting beans and corn in time to plant a good mix of cover crop seed. Mm. I still have half of my 300 acres yet to pick. I've had the drill loaded for two weeks waiting to combine the beans. My variety of cover crop mixes uh, is down to cereal rye, triticale, peas, vetch, and clover. That high boy planter seems more and more like the way to go. Every year, for one reason or eight others, we can't seem to get covers planted before mid to late November. Um, do you have any other suggestions, you know, on that, or you know, how how would you advise Matt, you know, to overcome turn that challenge into an opportunity? Yeah. So I mean, there are some good options. I think you know whether you have a a high clearance rig in the area. I mean, I know they're becoming more and more prevalent, at least in here in the Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin area that I work primarily in. But I mean, aerial application, whether it's with a helicopter or chopper, we regularly have lots of that flown on. Um, with that, I would would encourage, you know, trying to really time it before a rain, you know, because um, I've had I've worked with some growers that we did several thousand acres one one fall and it didn't rain for 22 days after that that was a learning experience and many of those guys went and bought no-till drills <laughs> that winter um so yeah i mean i think there are opportunities the other thing i would offer is um what's the reason why you know is it wh why you know could we select a little bit earlier maturing bean or corn and that helps us get that at least maybe even just half the acres out. Maybe we just take a relative maturity bean of X number and, and you know, back it off a little bit. Um, that would be one idea. Or uh, look for somebody that does custom work on the side and that does like the no-till planting and they can, you know, maybe it's not you doing it with your no-till drill. Maybe you don't have time for that. Maybe you hire somebody or, you know, that can run it for you. So that'd be my, I guess, knee-jerk thought. Sure, sure about uh you probably recognize th this picture here on our solo health resource guide tell tell people uh i'll, I'll talk a little bit about our photo contest because we're starting that up again but sure. tell people a little bit about you know what this picture represents and how that might be one potential solution for some of what matt's dealing with sure so the picture that keith is showing there is a friend of mine luke burglar he actually is a neighbor and uh whatnot he's been really innovating and trying different things so he that 60 inch corn there that he grew um, would have been last year and actually cut his nitrogen rates I think down to about 100 pounds but planted you know in row a little higher population you know doubled the population essentially and then came through with a rotary hoe with a gandy box mounted on top of that and I don't recall the exact yield that he got but again we have to be careful how we look at yield um, because with in Luke's case, I believe he got four or five weeks of grazing off of those stalks and that cover. And if you'd have dug down, um, or, or you know, I think you can go online and get a free one, or that they, they can contact you to get one. Um, but you know, the, the 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 amount of forage that was there and the diversity and the the quality. Um, I know he even had samples taken, and it was like there's no reason to even have lick tubs out here, and as long as we don't get two feet of snow or better um there was some excellent forage out there um not just for the cow herd but then again think about what happened for in the the underground herd or the soil the soil cows so so i don't know if that's what what you're getting at but that is a picture from just up the road that Luke yeah Luke's yeah on. and and you know a lot of people aren't probably ready to make that 
maybe a oh. radical step to 60 inch corn. Certainly the, the guys with livestock, it's certainly, uh, I think a very, very viable option because a lot of the research is showing that you don't give up a tremendous amount of yield, you know, maybe 5%. A lot of the practical farmers of Iowa stuff, that's kind of what they've been seeing. But the amount of forage that you get is, is really good. But you can do the same thing in a 30 inch row. Now you oh, don't sure. have the solar energy coming in to help those cover crops grow. So, you know, you're, you're not going to get these nice big plants growing like this, but I've seen some pretty decent stuff. And, yeah. and the thing is with that system, with interceding cover crops into corn at B3 or B4, the further North you are, the better that system works. The further right. South you are, the worse it works because when you're North, your summers are shorter and your days are longer. So you have more days of sunlight for a shorter period of time, but that's really what you need because uh, right. when you can't get your cover crops to grow underneath a corn canopy, it's typically because of lack of sunlight. And so, right. uh, and, and, and you showed some pictures, you, you have uh, quite a few guys using those rotary hose like that and just kind of blowing the seed out and stirring it up. Yeah. Or Yeah. They're, I don't know. I think there's at least a half a dozen just in the county that I, you know, when I used to work here at Winona Soil and Water and um, more and more guys, you know, getting them or finding them at auctions. And, and I think even one thing to think about too, Keith, you know, like right here on the I-90 corridor that I'm located, you know, it's an annual ryegrass based mix, but you get on the I-94 corridor um, and guess what? They're using cereal rye that because of the shorter uh, window of, of just growing season totally, they're actually able to get that to establish and then um, it comes through real nice in the fall versus down here we've tried it and it's not it doesn't fit our context right our our social environmental our spiritual context that you know so that's just kind of an extension of what you're talking about so yeah yeah so you know there, there are there are some options out there you know it may take a little experimentation and I, I always encourage, and I know Lance does the same thing. You don't have to start on the whole farm to learn something. I mean, no. good grief. You can learn as much on five acres as you can learn on 500, uh, maybe even more because you would tend to look at it a lot more often because it's all, you know, just in one place. So do something, uh, you know, whether it's uh, something at B2, you know, B3, V4 like this, or, uh, you know, plant a little field of a shorter season corn or bean, like what Lance was suggesting, so you could get out there a little bit sooner. But, you know, do a few things like that, and, and you'll start learning what some of those tricks are. Uh, I want to go back to one other thing that you talked about, uh, Lance, that I thought was kind of interesting. When you showed the pictures there of the cover crop, the, the roller crimpers, you talked about, you know, you were planting a really heavy rate of rye, 120 pounds of rye. Mm -hmm. uh did you plant that and, and i've heard of other people planting those really high rates like that is that intended just to try to maximize the biomass that you were going to grow uh mm -hmm. did you think it would roll better at a heavier rate because i've had people tell me that that you know those heavier stands of rye will roll better mm -hmm. uh so give us a little background of why you you know did those heavy seeding rates and also you know what would be considered more of a normal rate in your area yeah. So for roller crimping, kind of the general advice, at least around here is for surely needs to be at least a hundred pounds, somewhere in that 100, actually 150. <laughs> Sometimes I hear people using, um, but yeah, then the sooner we can get it in, um, that's really the optimal because then we have better tillering, we have better establishment. And so that's really where we get our, the ideal amount of biomass um, for the you know, when we're out there, you know, later in spring, because frankly, that's when we have to wait for the ride to mature and be, be at anthesis. So I think 120 is pretty, pretty typical. I think with Sheldon, those pictures I showed to him and Mike, um, I think they're going to go um, a little bit heavier. I think they did go like 130 or 140 this year. Um, one thing we learned is one of the guys had used VNS rye. So we learned some things about maturity and how it's delayed with different, if it's not just mm -hmm. one variety. Um, so that, yeah, I would say that's, uh, that's the general advice, at least around here. And, but as far as like corn, meat, corn, and after soybeans and whatnot, 40 to 50 pounds is becoming pretty, especially after you get used to it, you know, you start off at maybe 60 or 70 to have your comfortability level. Um, 
And so that I see a lot of guys at that 40 to 50 pound mark. Yeah. Now. Yeah. We, we see that too. Uh, Catherine is asking what all is in your crazy mix. <laughs> uh, it's got three millets, um, sorghum sedan, five or six clovers, oats, sunflowers, buckwheat, phacelia. Um, let's see. I'd have to look at the slip lentils, lupin. Um, yeah, you kind of caught me off guard, but it, it, it was, uh, yeah, I just, I did seven acres of it and I did it initially for like a teaching, uh, place where I can take our guests again out and dig and use my best friend, the shovel. Um, and then after mid season, I thought, well, why not flash across it and graze it? And then actually some of it, we double grazed because the sorghum came back. Um, yeah, peas, I'm trying to think there was, I want to say 27 or 29 species, but I'd have to look at, but everything, but, um, and the, the neat part is now, again, I drilled that grazed it. And then I, again, I redrilled it here a couple of weeks ago, heavy rye with hairy vetch camelina. And part of that's going to be no-till pumpkins this, uh, coming year. And part of it will be, um, mostly straight sunflowers that we're going to use for photography purposes. So, and then part of it again, will have to be crazy mix so we can graze and learn how covers interact. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. There's great power and diversity. And, and sometimes it's not quite as important what the things are in there, but you know, do you have a lot of different plant families represented? Right. Uh, you can go back into our webinar archive. Christine Jones has a, mm -hmm. some great talks from uh, January and February of this year uh, where she really stresses the importance of diversity of plant families in those mixes. Sure. Um, uh, we're about out of time here. So uh, Lance, thank you very much. I, I do want to just uh, again point out, this is uh, the picture that Lance submitted. Uh, we do have our photo contest open again. Lance, I, I saw some great pictures. You might want to submit again. There's no, nothing that says you can't win two years in a row. Yeah, all right, um, right. So we do have a contest going on. Uh, submit your best soil health picture. Uh, we'll select the, the, the one that we think represents soil health the best. Uh, for the cover of our resource guide. Uh, we will use other ones inside the guide as well uh, because it's it's just full of, of lots of different pictures. And so uh, we will use some of those in there as well. Uh, if you want to send some of those in, just send it to Noah at greencoverseed.com and uh, he will kind of keep track of those. Uh, next week's webinar, like I said earlier, uh, Matt Kincaid from uh, Jasper, Missouri will be sharing some of his experiences, uh, some of the things that he's doing uh, down in uh, Missouri to to promote soil health on his farm. So, uh, Lance, thank you again. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you getting here under under tough circumstances <laughs> with your tire yeah. blowing out there. But I know that everybody enjoyed it and uh, we all benefited from it. So, uh, yeah. thanks everybody. And uh, like Lance says, long live the land. Yep. Good night, thanks, everyone. You bet. <laughs>